Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and today I'm joined by Danielle Farsani, who's from Universidad Finisterra. Uh, Danielle, thanks so much for being here to talk with me. Thanks for the invitation, Sam. We are going to be talking about a recent article by Danielle that was published in ReadyMat, Journal of Research and Mathematics Education. And the English title for this uh, work is How Do Teachers' Gestures Affect Students and Girls' Visual Attention During the Mathematical Discourse? So, Danielle, I'm excited to hear a little bit about gesture and students' attention in that work. It's kind of a, a fascinating study that I wanted to pick your brain about. But before we get there, um, I just wanted to ask where you did your graduate studies and who did you work with during graduate school? I can say that I'm a grand academic grandson of John Mason. Uh, so my post, well, my, my PhD supervisor called Dave Hewitt at the University of Birmingham and who was a student of John Mason. I was interested in the theme of gestures and nonverbal communication and actually communication which can be down you know which can be described as a verbal vocal and visual what you say how you say it and the use of gestures proxemics nonverbal communication in mathematics education so dave hewitt gets brought up a lot here at the university of missouri in conversations because he wrote these pieces about the arbitrary and the necessary in mathematics. That's right. And that's an idea that has uh, kind of gotten taken up. It just comes up in conversation uh, as a useful way to think about mathematical truths. And like, which are the mathematical truths that sort of necessarily come forth from mathematical structures? And then which are the truths that are kind of like, they were decided by some human beings to do it that way, you know, but it, but it could have been different if we had decided it differently. Of course. Yeah. Depends on the culture. Depends on the time. Yes, absolutely. So that's cool. I, I, that's great to meet somebody who's kind of from that academic lineage, so to speak. But um, let's let's go along with this idea of gestures. So in ReadyMat, um, you have this article on gestures. Uh, what was the inspiration? What was the sort of start to this study? Um, I think the start was more of a method, the lack of methodology, I think, that, that we encountered. Because I'm interested in interaction. And usually in education, often the data that we have comes from a, emerges from a third person's perspective. Meaning there is a camera at the back of a classroom that is not a teacher's own perspective, nor the student's. And then we try to make meaning or interpret what's happening in the classroom from a third person's perspective. You know, that was what was acceptable in the 70s or in the, eight, in the 80s. Okay, but nowadays, because of the development of new technological mobile devices or, or sort of eye gazes or eye tracking devices, we thought, hey, let's give it a try. Let's unpack, let's open the black box of classroom interaction from the first person's perspective, that is, the students themselves. And the, I think there was number 33 girls. We've looked at 33 girls in mathematics lessons and um, to see the reality from their perspective. So that was the semi-methodological awareness that we wanted to show. Because usually with eyeglasses, I mean eye tracking, because due to the high prices, people look at one, two, three, maximum five students. So yeah, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Yeah, and it is it is a fascinating thing to sort of open up an article and be like, oh, we're going to actually get to see things through the student's eyes. It, it is kind of an exciting sort of methodology to dive into. And how did the team come together that worked on this article with you? Well, I've made a data collection and part of the analysis. I was really interested in sort of disseminating this finding in a Spanish journal because... Um, as you might be aware, there would be a lot of people interested in eye gaze or nonverbal communication in maths education who are not communicative competent in English to the extent that is needed to be able to read academic papers. So we thought, let's look at a you know, suitable journal in maths education that publishes in Spanish. So the target audience would be Spanish speakers or even Portuguese speakers to the extent, or even Romanian speakers that can actually understand Spanish, which I was surprised so, in collaboration, we wrote the paper, and we actually are working on more papers, actually, which we decided to to write it in Portuguese for a different target audience. <laughs> and so, 
aiming for this kind of international sort of dissemination with uh, certain sort of speakers in mind. I, you're situated in Chile, but uh, where do your co-authors reside? Yes, I'm in Chile, and one of my co-authors, Adriana Breda, she's actually Brazilian, a native Portuguese speaker, and she's currently assistant professor in University of Barcelona. And the other co-author, Gemma Sala, she is from Barcelona, she's bilingual, she speaks Catalan and Spanish, and she's in the same university. So you talked about this inspiration methodologically, and it was very fun to read about your data collection. But just tell us a little bit more about the data that you collected, how you collected it, and then talk to us about the analysis that you did where you looked at students' visual attention, and you also brought into it the teacher coming into the gaze of the students and then the teacher's gesturing. So a little bit about the data and then a little bit about how you did the analysis. Sure. So what we did was we bought these sort of cheap Chinese-made head, uh, gla you know, gaze glasses, um, and the idea was to give it to every single student, uh, you know, given the ethical considerations, etc. The idea was to compare different sub, not just mathematics, but we wanted to see, for example, whether a student pays more attention in mathematics lessons versus English or in sciences. And actually, they, from the other paper that we are doing, yes, the students are paying, are more visually engaged to the teacher in mathematics lessons than any other subject, which is interesting, actually. These have the recording capacity of about 90 minutes, 95 minutes, depending on the age. Obviously, the older they are, the, the, the less they can record. And at the end of the day, you manually download the, the data to the computer. So that was a sort of a data collection aspect. Data analysis was very many layered, actually. The first one, we wanted to know how are they engaged on the teacher during the instruction and information, during the teaching, during the assessments, right? So what we did was we took a photo of a, fo of a teacher from different angles, from a profile, we took a photo of a teacher's face from the face, from top above, and we inserted it into Google, Google Images, Google Photos. What we did was this... Video recordings have a capability of 30 frames per second. So we... From the 30 frames, we actually took one frame, so one frame representing one second now. Then what we did was we sent it through Google Images, and every frame had an ID. So let's say frame number 427 was actually 427 seconds, right? So we knew exactly which frame corresponded to what, to what a student, to what date, to what classroom. And Google Images sort of automatically gave us all the frames in which teacher's face was apparent. However, I should say mm, semi-automatically semi and semi-objectively because <laughs> one of the problems we obtained was if it was dark, so let's say if it was early in the morning and the sun wasn't bright, if it was dark, sort of the Google images didn't really recognize teacher's faces that was a bit of a problem, uh, or if the light was it was too bright, um, let's say um, teacher's forehead would have been invisible in in a sense. So, anyways, but again, that that error was very marginal. We're talking, we're looking at seven hundred and fifty thousand frames. We looked at almost you know quarter, three quarters of a million frames. We looked at. So the error margin was low and maybe less than one percent, and it wouldn't have affected the nature of our analysis as such. So that's why we say it was semi-automatic and semi-objective. But then, okay, let's say we have frame 427. What was the teacher actually was doing that captured the student's visual attention? Was the teacher talking? Was the teacher walking? Was the teacher gesturing? Was the teacher sitting at his or her desk? Was the teacher was of mingling with the students in a closer proximity relationship relation? Uh, so we identified a number of nonverbal cues and also what proximity distance the teacher was doing. So there are four zones, uh, which we call it private, personal, professional, and public zones. So that comes from the notion of Edward Hall, the anthropologist, the American anthropologist, that he says there are four zones. These zones vary across culture to culture and across. Um, different social activities, so if you're in a lift, if you're in a lift in a confined space, you know, you would, you have no other choice but to be with seven other strangers, right? And again, there is a myth that, as a teacher, you, you say, if, it's, if there is a student that is misbehaving, ask him or her to come and sit at the front, so they would pay more attention. Actually, we didn't find that. 
private space is from zero, so like contact, zero to 45 centimeters. Personal space, which of course varies from culture to culture, is from 46 to 120 centimeters, so 1.2 meters. From 1.2 meters to 3.6 or 3.7 meters is actually the professional space. And from, I can't remember, from 3.6 or 3.7 meters beyond is the public space. We actually found the highest amount of interaction, visual interaction, that our students are more visually engaged to their teachers. Would you, do you want to have a guess from which of these distances actually? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I try to just think from life, I would say personal space, where it's kind of like you're coming fairly close to me, you're not leaning right up to my cheek, but you know, you're right there, and that, that's what I would guess. I mean, that would have been a very, gen you know, most people would think that. And that's why most people would say, you know, Oi, Tommy, come and sit here in the first row next to me. Actually, it's in a professional zone and public zone. So from 1.2 meters to 3.6 meters um, and 3.6 meters above. And that's, that's partially maybe because of the structure of the classroom, right? You have the first row, second row, and then anything beyond the third row or even sometimes secondary, is actually a professional space. So a lot has to do maybe with the structure of the classrooms. And again, depends also, I mean, we realize that teachers' gestures capture the students' visual attention almost 40% more in mathematics lessons during the instructional information. And that could have actually great pedagogical implications for teachers. But also, pointing is a subset of gesturing. Pointing to, I mean, how many times we remember we had a grandmother telling us never ever point at someone. And while she was saying that, she was actually pointing to us. <laughs> so we realized that when teacher is pointing either to the inscriptions, to the, to the board, to the, to the students themselves, teachers pointing gestures are very effective, especially in public distances. Of course, there is an aspect of age difference and like, for example, the six-year-olds, they tend to pay more visual attention to the teacher in sort of private and personal zones, because, and especially between the girls, especially if the teacher is a woman and the students are girls, is very, it's again, a cultural context that a teacher can come and keep their hair and touch them is fine. The notion of touch, even though they're not allowed to, but again, uh, it's a cultural aspect. However, with 14, 15 year old boys, students, you don't see that and you don't and you don't expect any sort of a interaction in a private space, which is from zero to 45 centimeters. And again, in psychology, we say the two F's, right? Two men in a private zone means fight or the other F. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Some so, things are international. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot depends on the age as well. In terms of your study design, you started with when, when are the moments that the students are looking at the teacher, like the, the teacher's face is actually included in their gaze. So they're not looking down at their paper, they're not looking over at friends, like they're looking and can see the teacher. In this analysis, you then found that there was this relationship between, okay, when the teacher shows up in the visual gaze, it's actually very often associated with gestures, right? But this, I also just wanted to clarify in the design, you did not follow the teacher and then look at all the moments when they gestured and then see how that relates to the student attention. You were following the student attention and then realizing, wow, gesture seems to be a powerful thing that's associated, but coming from the direction of like the student attention forward. Does that make sense? Back in the 70s or 80s, the focus was on the teacher. Again, that's actually the third person's perspective. So yeah, that's an important aspect to acknowledge and to... to the originality of the design, I would say, and especially to have that amount of data. That was something that was very specific. And as I said, it has a very interesting practical implications for teaching in mathematics. So, I mean, when you want to teach a new subject, you want to make sure that students are paying attention, paying visual attention to the teacher, right? So how can we attract that? How can we make sure that students are sharp in relation to that they want to, they want to, they're, they're attentive to pay attention. So that was an interesting aspect that we found. And with some classes, for example, with language ones, when, when the students had the same teacher, mathematics teacher and language teacher, strangely enough, the notion, the nature of the subject, mathematics, captured 
more students' attention in their mathematics lessons. We looked at subcategories of uh, high attainers versus low attainers in mathematics. So we had an average of their scores, let's say, I mean, in percentage, let's say 55% was the average. Those that scored 55 or above, we said, okay, they're high attainers in mathematics. And those that are, let's say, less than, uh, so 54 or less, they would have been lower attainers. And we realized that high attainers, they are more visually engaged on the mathematics lessons over the period of the 90 minutes long lessons. I mean, that's how long the lessons are in Chile usually than their lower attainer counterparts. And strangely enough, one would say that students maybe are more visually engaged in the first five, 10 minutes of the lesson maybe, or maybe not the first five minutes because they're still hyper by the time they sit down or for them books, maybe the first 10 minutes. We realize that actually there is a peak about 48 minutes. Hmm. At around 40 minutes, both boys, girls, high attainers, lower attainers, introverts, extroverts, those that live at home with their mother or with their uncle or both parents, those that are come on, like in the UK, you call it um, free school meal students, those that are sort of vulnerable financially, independent of all the psychological, sociological differences at the 40th minute, independent of the subject, if it's maths or sciences, or students are visually engaged at the 40th minute. The significance of that, the p-value is like less than 10,000. I mean, it was a big surprise for us. Hmm. Why? I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it could be something that's like related to the students and just the flow of attention. But it also could be something that's an artifact of lesson design. Like if if people tend to have a lesson that builds to something that happens around there, you know, so it could sort of be a cause from either direction or a combination of things. But the fact that you could make lessons in Chile are 90 minutes. And maybe students know, maybe that at about 50th minute, the teacher would give them like a five minutes break. So at about 40th minute, they are looking to that pause maybe to sort of to refuel their brains, for example. That We don't have a concrete answer or hypothesis, for, but for us, it was very interesting. Independent of the subject or independent of the zone that they are sitting in, the proximic zones or attainers in mathematics or sciences or English, that was a golden zone uh, of 40th minute. And of course, towards the 90th minute, almost the visual attention is zero, almost zero. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a point at which it's like, wow, okay, I need a little bit of a break or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask you about some of the other work that you're doing along this line and some of your future ideas. But um, before we leave the ready map paper, I just want to see, are there any other kind of takeaways or main ideas that you want people to take from the ready map paper? Again, from the ready map paper, we only looked at 33 girls. So it wasn't really much of a comparison to boys and girls, let's say. And it was one year group, I believe. It was the fourth grade, which was about 10 and a half years old. But we looked at... In other papers, we looked at first graders, um, fourth graders, sixth graders, and also eighth graders. So there was a variety of ages. But from the ready map, I think that would be the sort of principal opening paper to to our results and research and the methodological, methodological approach that we made. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that you're still working on exploring now? And you've mentioned some other papers. So, you know, where, where is this research taking you now since the ready map paper? That's a very good question because, I mean, after analyzing 750,000 frames that was done manually by me because I had to look at each frame, we are getting a few more papers on that with different, with different aspects. So comparison between maths and English, boys versus girls, different age groups, different proximics levels, high attainers, low attainers, etc. And again, we published a recent paper in a very good journal of uh, journal of computer assisted learning. Actually, we sent another paper recently to another journal for research in maths education uh, under review now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> My sort of next approach would be not just a student's visual attention to the teacher, but whether we can identify from a body language perspective, whether we can identify those that are lower attainers in mathematics at the beginning of the year first grade because many schools in the world many first graders may not have a register of their mathematical attainments 
right? Because they've never been to school. Some countries at the age of five, at the age of six, at the age of seven, in some countries like Iran. So the idea is, can we look at the student and the teacher? And again, by look, I don't mean manual look. I mean, you know, using specific softwares and methodological approaches and to look for their nonverbal interaction in the classroom and to identify whether, let's say, Alex in six months time, is he going to get higher grades and good grades in mathematics or lower grades? And if he's going to get lower grades, what interventions can we put in place right at the beginning of the year so that no one is left out, right? So that they can be on board from the beginning with the right interventions. But with the right interventions, we need to detect who's going to... And hold on a second. If we can detect potential criminals in the airport, people that might be carrying more than $10,000 in cash in their bag, drugs, or a recent photo of her father or of someone's mother that has recently died, because all these three are valuable to that person at that specific moment in time, right? If we can identify that, why can't we identify lower attainers in mathematics? So this is the project that I'm currently working on with a methodology that's called MEA, Motion Energy Analysis. It's about the synchronized movement between the teacher and the students. I have some data that I can show you later from the video that we know, okay, let's talk about in a relationship, a good relationship is when both man and woman, both men and men or woman and woman are synchronized themselves. And synchronization, that doesn't mean, and again, I don't know if you have a pet or, or, or something, some pets actually look like their owners after 10 years or vice versa. <laughs> so we are looking at the framework of a psychological framework of interactional synchrony. And we are using that in the classroom to see whether we can actually identify high so the prediction the theory is that those that are the higher attainers in mathematics are they're more likely to synchronize the non-verbal movements of the teacher and from motion energy analysis we can actually look at every change of the pixel pixel changes in the in the movement between the higher attainers and the lower and the, and the teacher we can actually identify lower attainers in in mathematics at the beginning of the year something i'm currently looking at now yeah, and I know, and you talked about like you know the goal to be to try to provide help and support and like positive learning experiences as early as possible. Um, I, I hear as like the motivation, but it's also making me think about people that just say I had this teacher that really connected with me or that really resonated with me. And you're sort of saying there might actually even be some underlying movement energy mechanisms that are happening where like you are in sync. It also makes me think about you know the importance of having diversity in the teaching force so that it's not the same students that are able to resonate with their teachers like year after year, class after class. If we have a more diverse teaching force, it sort of provides more opportunities for that student to feel in sync and to feel that resonating energy kind of with the teacher. So I'm kind of connecting it to, to other other topics that are also kind of going on in math education. Oh, absolutely. Like to have, you know, you're out of sync or I mean, anything from a handshake to when a ballet dancer, she when she's synchronizing herself to the music, that's actually synchrony. Anything to the Mexican wave in football, that, that's synchrony. Um, anything to the military march, that's an amazing synchrony. Because if with every step, if a soldier makes one millimeter of mistake in a march of 200 meters that he has to do, he will be out of sync. So mm -hmm. is actually the value of synchronization or getting on with one another? I think we should take it literal. And in research in math, okay, maybe it's more of a psychology and not so much of a maths education. Obviously, it will have practical implications for mathematics education, but I think it's something important for the detection of those that could be diagnosed with dyscalculia right at the beginning of the year. And with the right interventions, we can improve their attitude towards mathematics. Oh, maths is boring. I don't get anything. Oh, I don't, want, I don't understand it. I think that attitude can change with the right intervention. My guest is Danielle Farsani, who's uh, at the Universidad Finestera in Chile, and it's been nice talking to you. I wanna ask one final question, Danielle. If you were not in math education and, and thinking about these ideas related to psychology and movement and everything, if you were doing something completely separate, what could you imagine as an alternative career? I think that would depend on which country I would be in. If I'm back in the UK, I would join the family tradition of going to the Sandhurst Military Academy be a military officer. If I was in Chile and had a Chilean citizenship, I think I would have joined the police force in Chile. 
but I think it would be something related to the armed forces around that. Yeah, do you have some connection or do you have family connections to those forces? Sure, sure. All right, well, it's been great talking to you, and it sounds like I actually have some more reading that I want to do to follow some of these other ideas uh, in some of the other journals, but um, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us about what you're working on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.